Okay. So if you are here for the Med Mentors um, Mythbusters panel, you're in the right place. Um, to get things started, I guess we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, just tell us your name, what year you are, um, I don't know, where you went to undergrad, the usual stuff that we do. If anyone wants to go first. I can go. Um, hi, my name is Aria, um, MS4, um, originally from Los Angeles, went to school at Berkeley, and I'm applying into OBGYN. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm an MS4 as well. I went to University of Michigan. I'm applying into anesthesia, and I'll be on the chat in the background. Hi, I'm Gabby. I'm also an MS4. Um, I'm originally from Alabama, went to school at Stanford and then here at UCLA, probably applying into IM, but we'll see. Um, um, hey guys, I'm Danielle. I'm an MS1, so I'm like the youngest um, of, this, of this panel or the newest um, to med school. Um, I, am, I was like born in Chicago and then I went to middle school and high school in Colorado. Um, I went to Princeton for undergrad, and then I took a gap year, spent it in Dallas, um, working for a year, and now I'm here. Um, I will also introduce myself. I am Megan. I am also an MS4, and we're so glad that Danielle is here so that we can have a little bit of variety in perspective. I am originally from the Bay Area, also in TC Berkeley, like Aria, go Bears. Um, and as an MS4, I am thinking about applying into psychiatry. Um, so just to kind of like get things oriented, um, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, feel free to type them under the Q and A function. Um, Christina will be chatting away with you and answering those questions. And if we don't get to them over chat, we'll answer them at the end for the last like 10 minutes of in-person like, uh, Q and A. Um, if you have seen the agenda, we kind of split this up into three sections. We're going to start about talking about like admissions myths, which there are so many of, um, and then kind of move into the sort of like academic and like social life myths that come with actually being in medical school um, as well. So to kind of kick it off um, for the admissions process, I guess the question that we, I saw the most um, from people was, do you need like a 4.0 GPA? Do you need a 520 MCAT? Will I get into med school without those? Um, so panelists, what are your thoughts? Is that a myth? I didn't have it and I'm still here. So it's a pretty good sign that it's not true. Um, yeah, you don't have to be the perfect applicant. Like, of course, it doesn't hurt to be the perfect applicant, but you also a lot of it is the um, personality and like what you bring to the table through your experiences, medically related or not. Because a lot of what I did was like language related. I liked going abroad, learning new languages. And I had fun talking about that on interviews and stuff. So it's really how well you can vibe with uh, your interviewers and whoever happens to see your application. Yeah, and I think like like certain schools prioritize certain pieces of your of people's candidacy, and so you want to like apply to schools that want your strengths and the strengths that you have. So I think some schools prioritize like stats like GPA and MCAT scores more than others, and other schools will like be really interested in in you as like the in the community service that you've done, or yeah, in like the global health work that you've done, or something. So. I think you can also sort of, if you know that you have like lower than average stats, you can tailor the list of schools that you apply to, to match, um, to suit your strengths in that way. Yeah, and kind of just to bounce off that a little bit, um, uh, the way I like to think about it is you're kind of telling a story when you apply. And if you hit every single one of these kind of categories that we're talking about, that's kind of, I don't know, I don't wanna say boring, but it's very redundant. Um, and so a lot of people are going to have a lot of different types of skills. And so what kind of workforce would you want for doctors, people who are all the same, who have all the same high stats or some people who are diverse. So I think having that as my, in your mind as well um, is important because not everyone out there practicing medicine is this type of like perfect applicant. 
Yeah, definitely a myth there. And there are plenty of resources as well as you like apply into med school that can actually show you what the averages are for different schools. And many, actually most schools don't have those kinds of numbers anyway. So even from a numerical standpoint, like it's just not true. Uh, but kind of building off of what Arya said, another kind of question that a lot of people wonder is, is there any one extracurricular that I have to have? Like if I don't have research, I won't get into medical school, true or false? I feel, I feel like we know this to be false. You know, I feel like it's it's like the same things we've been kind of saying where it's like what Arya said, you, you're you building a narrative for yourself. So if your narrative is research, like go off and talk about it and be passionate about it and like have that be like the centering piece of your candidacy. If that's not your centering piece and that's not you, that's also fine. You just have to find like kind of what you feel like unifies like your desire to go to medicine. And it doesn't even have to be like one thing, but I think like a unifying narrative or unifying theme that you can really call your own. And like, that's what will make you come across as really passionate in interviews. That's what will make your personal statement really compelling. Um, and it doesn't have to be, there's no one thing that it has to be or another. I feel like that was a pretty good response, but Gabby has something else to say. So I will let her say it. Yeah, I think while I was in college, um, most people had like a, they were like working on publications. I never got to that point. So I ended up having some research experience for primarily during a uh, summer break. And that was pretty much the achievement. Nothing came of it. And that was clearly all right. I think it's good as long as you do, if you even just like, I don't think research is a bad thing to at least try out, especially in a lot of um, academic settings. It's kind of going to be shoved down your throat to some ex extent. So having an idea of just how it works isn't a bad idea. But um, if it's not for you, after you try it out and you're, you're like, this isn't really what I want in the long run, it's perfectly fine to say, all right, no, that was a good time. And you can talk about it. You should be able to talk about it, but it doesn't have to be the chief thing of your application. Yeah, I just wanna really emphasize what Gabby just said. Um, even if you decide not to do it, talk about it, like have something to say about that experience, because I promise you someone's going to ask on the interview train about research, like very, very broadly. And even if you did zero research, you want to say confidently, I did zero research because of X, Y, or Z reason, and I just don't like it. And that's okay. But just have something to say about it too. Um. What about your majors? If you wouldn't mind sharing what your major was and if any of you had non-biology majors and if, or minors or anything that um, kind of influenced the admissions process for you. Um, I wish I could speak more to this, but I was a bio major and a nutri minor. So not very helpful on this topic. <laughs> I was also a bio major, but I was also an Italian minor, and I actually got a letter of rec from my Italian professor, um, which I think was a really good letter in the end. Nice. Um, I studied public health, um, and I minored in public policy and global poverty, so a little bit different than biology. Um, I think it's totally normal nowadays for people to kind of major in things that are not strict biology majors um, or fields. And as long as you can learn that material that are prerequisites for medical school in another way, either through a post back or just on the side, in addition to your core requirements, there's no type of myth that you need to be a bio major. Yeah, I was a chemistry major kind of the same, but a little bit different. Um, and I don't feel like it played a huge role in my application process one way or another. Um, it was like, I chose it because it's what I liked the best and like what I wanted to study. And I wasn't really thinking about um, how it would affect like my wanting to go to med school. Awesome. Um, and then kind of our last question for the sort of admission side of things is gap years. Do you need them? Do you not need them? I feel like this is 
very personal and I'm sure we all have our own opinions. So um, love to hear what your decision process around that was. Yeah, I can start here. Um, at first I was like, I don't wanna take a gap year. That's like a waste of a year of my life. And then I started to think about it more and I was like, no, I actually think it would, I would be a much better candidate if I applied one year out. And that was for a couple of reasons. The first being like, I, it would allow me to study for the MCAT over a summer and like take it in the fall, which was like going to be good for my, I didn't have to study like during the school year. And um, so that made sense how it was going to lay out like that. Um, I was also writing a thesis my senior year. And so if I had applied, if I didn't take a gap year, I would have had to apply like my junior summer or junior spring. And then like all of my thesis work wouldn't have been on it yet. Um, I worked in a lab that was like me and two other people. So I saw my PI like every day and we had a really close relationship. And so I was like, I want his rec letter on my application. And like, I'll have worked with him for another year if I take a gap year before he writes that letter. And like, so that I felt like was gonna make me a stronger candidate. And then plus like, I decided a little bit late in college to go to med school or want to go to med school. So I feel like I didn't have a ton of clinical experience. Plus Princeton has no med school and no hospital. And so like, there's not a lot of opportunity in college to get clinical experience. So I was like, I think I'd be a better candidate if I took a year off, like did more clinical stuff would get the rec letter from my advisor, would have all my thesis research on there. Um, so it was like partially that. And then that was like kind of my pre gap year thought process. And then now kind of being on the other side of it, I'm also just really grateful for like having a year to be a real adult. I think I matured a lot. I think I also had some separation from the like, I have to get all A's and I have to be trying really hard. And when med school's pass fail, and I think it's really hard to pull yourself out of that mentality, but people who have taken time off are like, have been out of that mentality. And so they have an easier time kind of adjusting to the pass fail style of med school. I think that has done me a lot of good um, in being able to prioritize my work life balance here. And um, yeah, so I, I think a gap year was good for me. I'm not saying it's good for everyone, but I think I like, when I really sat down and thought about it, I was like, I think this is, um, you know, what makes the most sense for me. So maybe some of that resonates with you guys as well. I also ended up taking a gap year and it literally came, initially when I started um, undergrad, I was like, I'll just go straight through. I don't really see the point of taking a gap year. I know what I want to do. Um, and then it came down to the decision of if I wanted to study abroad again or take a gap or, or um, go straight into med school. And I was like, med medicine can wait. They, you have four years and the rest of your life to do this. So it's, and it was not a hard decision. I was just like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna just drop medicine for a year. And that is perfectly fine. It's an opportunity to see other things that you might not get to experience otherwise. So if there's like something you want to do, fully encourage you. If this, you're looking for a sign, should I do this for a gap year instead of going straight in? I'm going to say yes. It's just that, like um, Danielle was saying, it's an opportunity to, to experience a lot of different things. Um, and even if it's just to, like get your application in a place where you're more comfortable with it, that's worth it. You don't want to have to go through the application process more than once because it sucks. And just taking the time you need, fully support that. Yeah, I second. I'll keep it short. I took two gap years. Um, I felt like it was important, um, kind of in that non-traditional sense, um, being someone who wasn't a bio major, I almost went to a grad school as opposed to med school. So I felt like I needed a little bit more time to reassure myself that I didn't want to go through another like professional um, career route. So that's why I need a little bit more time. And like everyone said, highly recommend, even if you're for sure interested in medicine, you need a little bit of a break to reassess everything before you jump the gun and start the application cycle. I also took two gap years. So you've got uh, a lot of panelists who took gap years. Um, and I would also highly recommend, um, I thought it was good also financially for me. Um, I worked and lived at home and I saved money to pay for like my first two years of med school. So it was honestly a really good thing for me just from that perspective as well, on top of like all the emotional well being of having a full year to just like not deal with applications or anything. I was just a working adult. Um, and I, have to give that up for four years for med school. So I think it's a really nice transition. 
Okay, so speaking of transitions, um, let's kind of pivot towards med school, the thing that we're all doing right now as panelists. Um, let's kind of talk about the academic side of things. Like, I guess the number one question um, that I'm sure we've faced and people are wondering is, is it really that crazy? Like starting MS1, are you bombarded with all the knowledge that you have to learn or is it something that you can handle? So I want to defer a little bit to Danielle um, here. Um, and the reason why I say that is because the curriculum has changed a lot since the three of us up here or the four of us up here, technically Christina, um, have taken our, our like pre-clerkship courses, which were very different. But um, based on my experience our first year, I would say it's very similar to being in college um, in terms of the, it's maybe a little bit more rigorous for some people who, depending on what your major was or what institution you went to, but kind of the format of learning something, getting a quiz, and then getting a final exam is very similar to like your undergraduate coursework. Um, and that doesn't really change until you're a post, um, once you're actually in the clerkships. But I think uh, Danielle has a little bit more experience. Yeah, I think um, I have like a lot, I have like a couple of thoughts. I think first is, it's like, it's challenging, but in a different way from undergrad. Like I think in undergrad, and maybe this is just my experience, but my undergrad was like, like the content was challenging. It was like, I would like sit down with homework and be like, I like these problems are hard to solve. And I feel like in med school, what makes med school hard for me is not like each individual concept is really hard to understand. It's just like, you have 1000 concepts thrown at you each week. And then like, you, you're like trying to like learn them all and put them all in your head. And then the next week starts, it's like another set of a thousand concepts or a thousand things to know. So I think it's more the volume um, and like trying to fit it all in my head all at the same time than it is like each individual thing being really challenging. Um, so it's like, and, and but I, I think it's been rigorous, but I, my work-life balance has been a lot better in med school. Like I, my weekends are like, 75% fun, 25% work. And in college, it was like not that ratio. And I think I work hard to, to prioritize my life. Like, I think I'm very intentional about, you know, making sure I can afford to have weekends that are a lot of fun. But, um, but I think it's like a lot more possible for me in med school than it was in undergrad. Um, and then, yeah, I, there was something else I was going to say about the curriculum. Oh, the, I think, the other thing that makes it different than undergrad is like, it's very self-directed in med school. It's like each week I'm just presented with material and like there's, we, in the new curriculum, there's just a five question quiz on Friday and it's, it's only bonus points. So if you get them wrong, nothing happens. If you get them right, you get bonus points in the final. So like really there's no, there's no like check-ins like formal check-ins with like your, like you have to check in with yourself at the end of every week and be like, do I know this material? Or like, what can I do to learn this more? And what, how do I want to study this more outside of like what the lecture has taught me? And like, it's, it's very self-direct in that sense where I feel like undergrad was like, you have assignments and they have due dates and you keep, and then you have a midterm and then you have a final, like it's, you have more structured check-ins. So um, I think in med school, you get to be a little bit more independent with how you learn and know yourself a bit better. Um, but I think that's the kind of thing that you'll like learn over time once you get here. And you're like, I'm still, you know, working through exactly what, what works best for me, but yeah. Uh, just to provide a little context before anything gets too confusing. We keep talking about new curriculum, old curriculum. This is a UCLA specific thing that's happening right now. The MS4s on the panel had a traditional med school curriculum, which was like two sort of in lecture, classic learning, undergrad type of stuff. And then two um, like clinical years where we're in the hospital doing rotations. Um, as of this year, um, the curriculum has changed at UCLA where it's more of like a year, year and a half, I believe of, uh, Danielle, you can pitch in whenever you want about this, but um, a shortened sort of like academic classroom focused um, curriculum, one year in clinical rotations and a year off to explore interests. So uh, master's programs, research, et cetera, um, before going into a traditional fourth year clinical rotation again. So that's why we're kind of pivoting back and forth because what we might say about um, the first year experience will be a little bit different than what 
is currently happening at UCLA, but both of these types of programs continue to exist at different medical schools all over the country. So it's still useful depending on where you might end up. Sorry, Gabby, I, I could tell you were gonna say something and I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, that was very pertinent information. Um, Cause yeah, we know all about our curriculums, but it's very weird. And it's actually very hard to tell the difference between curriculums and applying. Um, but yeah, I was just gonna add that what was I going to add? Essentially, yeah, the, so I know you might not have experienced or heard the phrase yes, um, drinking from a fire hose, which is my most hated phrase ever. Everyone says it, you're gonna hear it so many times on interviews, it's so irritating. Um, but yeah, that's how they describe all of the information learning medicine. It's only getting bigger, you only have to learn more information every single year. So it's kind of accurate, but it's just not real a realistic picture. You're never gonna expect to drink from an entire fire hose. You're gonna catch a lot of the information, it's gonna get you drenched, but, and that's, how much it covers you is going to be enough to get you, you through medical school. Because the fact this is in medicine, you do not have to know all of these pertinent or these tiny little details about all of the diseases you may ever come across. It's not realistic for anyone to know that. So what the idea is, part, the real difficulty starting med school is just that you have to, like um, Danielle was saying, you have to actually adjust to how you need to learn for more self-directed learning right now. You need to figure out, do I need to use flashcards? Do I need to read a textbook? That kind of stuff. And then once you get your rhythm down, um, it might have to change with the next um, block of material, like it, switching from respiratory to cardiology. So that's mostly the difficult part in the first couple of years and the pre-clerkship portion of medical school. It's not so much the volume of information, but actually figuring out how can I learn best that volume of information. Um, speaking of using flashcards or reading books, um, is there a best way to study in medical school that you have found? Does everybody actually Anki all the time? We never lift our faces up from our phones. Is that true? Is that who we are? I am probably one of the worst offenders of Anki in our class. Um, I The moment I started, I think like between that and taking step, I don't think I ever missed a day. And that was just my method. I am, it worked for me. I don't regret using Anki. It wasn't, an, it was annoying. It was like, I was chained to this app every single day, but it paid off like a hundredfold. And it made me a lot less stress um, studying during first, second and third year. So I have no regrets, but it's annoying. A lot of people don't like it, and there are so many other ways to study. So if you don't like it, you do not have to use Anki. Yeah, I'll 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 go next because I am like the opposite of this. So I I'm like an audio visual learner. So Anki is like not not what serves me, you know. And I totally like credit the people who it does serve, and I love that for them. But I it does it just doesn't it's not efficient for me because I'll like get a flashcard and I'll just be like. No, but I need to like see where this is spatially like in the flow chart of like cardiac diseases like where are we and like I need that to like for things to like cement in my brain so like getting a random flashcard and I don't know like where it is in the in the space or anything else like it just doesn't work so what I do instead um it's like I'll watch the lectures and then I'll like watch supplemental videos and there's a lot of these that exist for med school so there's like a thing called boards and beyond which has a ton of videos um, on like all of our curriculum. There's Pathoma, which has a ton of videos for all of our curriculum. And then there's like Sketchy, which is like a memorization tool that has like animated videos, like cartoon basically for memorization. So I like watch all of those um, and to supplement like the lecture material. Um, and then the other, like the other thing I do is like I whiteboard everything. So I just like go to a classroom and I just like draw out flow charts and like draw out like schemas of diseases and like draw out like all the different mechanisms of actions of all the drugs like just kind of writing it down and having it in front of me it like will make me memorize it so I'm like the, the yeah the the non-Anki med student um and it, it's just like what works for for my learning I guess I'm kind of the Goldilocks in between because I sometimes use Anki, um, 
but I totally echo what everyone said. It depends on what your style is. And the most important thing is that it'll change throughout medical school. In the early years, we'll, you'll be focusing a lot more on the pathology of diseases. You might spend a lot more time on drawing things out um, and focusing on how everything works together on more of a scientific level. And then once you um, advance through the years, you'll be kind of focusing on just like the high yield, you know, disease treatment type of thing. Um, and that might be like a different study style. So um, be flexible, it'll change throughout the years um, and be patient with yourself. I'll just pitch in and say, I also onky like two days first year and then I gave up. So I am not an onkier. I like took written notes, like review notes, all of first year and into second year. And it worked for me. Um, I even brought some of my bad habits from undergrad into my med school studying. Like I definitely do a little bit of cramming um, before every test, even in, into third year and doing like our clinical shelf exams. I'm still a crammer and I, I think I will always be, but what cramming means to me in medical school is like cramming for two weeks instead of like, like it's not a day before kind of cramming and big tests are like three weeks of cramming. Um, so things do change, but you can still bring up some of your bad habits. You can still have your study style, whatever that is. It just kind of melds to what med school is. Um, okay. And then, um, I guess like one more question just about medical school academics, um, are things competitive? I know many of us came from undergrads that probably were at some level competitive. And I know UCLA can be very competitive in terms of like extracurriculars and everything that has to be done. Do you feel that medical school is better or worse or just a totally different beast altogether? All right, just a little clarification. Do you mean like, do we compete with each other? Yes. Yeah. Like, what is the environment like? Like, is it healthy? Oh. Unhealthy? Do they I have know, Megan, do you more, think more we're healthy? Um, I think we can be sometimes. Sometimes. We're <laughs> In all seriousness, I think um, it's going to be pretty institution dependent, and it's going to be, um, it can be even very class dependent. Uh, I think we got lucky with our class and everyone's pretty cooperative and we'll share resources whenever necessary. Um, so I never feel like nervous or awkward about reaching out for help to any member of our class. Uh, but I know this isn't, I feel like I'm, I just had a lucky experience in med school and it's not, that's not ubiquitous. So some places you might have to work a little harder to really maintain, like get good uh, grades, academics. and. One of the biggest benefits of going to UCLA is that we are unranked and our grades are um, pass fail. So we there's not there's not a lot of um, things in our environment that are like coercing us to actually backstab people. It's just that we can all win in this environment. Um, to add on, um, just to kind of contrast that from like something. Cause I, I totally great experience here, but in undergrad, I could say that I felt like there was a little bit more of that feeling of um, there's only so many research opportunities or there's so many positions or there's a curve, like only five people can get an A, what am I going to do? Um, it's not like that here. They, everyone wants you to succeed. Everyone's sharing resources from day one um, and everyone wants their peers to do well because it makes them look well as well. Cause you know, you all go to the same school. Um, so it's a very co collaborative environment, which I think is great. Um, I'm not sure what other medical schools um, that are ranked are like. Um, I can't really speak to that experience, but I think that's one of our biggest strengths as well. Yeah, I'd agree with both the panelists. I like I felt that my class had been really supportive and really collaborative and and like it it feels like a real community and not in like a fake way, like a a way that like you know people will post in the group me and like ask for help or ask for support and like the whole class will rally behind them so um but obviously i'm only in the first year so i don't know how like things like this change when you're on rotations to with another med student or something like that but that's you know i i haven't had any experiences where i felt like i'm competing against people the only thing i will say is like you feel sometimes pressure when like other people are like getting really cool research opportunities and you're like oh i feel like I need to have that too but that's not competition and I don't feel like that comes from like the classmate with the opportunity it just comes from like you comparing yourself to other people but um you know that is like something to sort of be aware of 
Um, yeah, I think I feel the same way. I think for the most part, we are not competitive, especially coming from undergrad, nothing compared to that. And people are very friendly and faculty are friendly and willing to help you, which is very different from my experience in undergrad, which eases up on all of these other things. Um, yeah, and the pass fail makes all the difference. Like, you know, we've had it from first all the way through third year in chart clinical rotations. Um, our fourth year is the first time we'll actually have any sort of ranked grading, um, but even that really is only for a few months. So it really takes the pressure off of, you know, constantly worrying about what other people think of you and, and worrying about how you're performing in context to other people. Um, but um, at schools that do have grades, I know that it can be more, we don't even have like AOA at UCLA anymore for a lot of reasons. But again, that kind of competitiveness goes away when you don't have um, things like that to compete for. Okay, and with that, um, and how things are easier with pass fail, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about our work life balance. I know Danielle already kind of like talked about it a little bit, but are we, are we able to be human beings? Like, do we have a personality outside of being a medical student? I think we do. Um, I hope you guys feel the same. Absolutely. I have, well, I mean, I've already sort of expressed the ratio of my work-life balance. I prioritize my life a lot. So like I said, I'm, I'm kind of always doing stuff and then just like when it's grind time, it's grind time. And, and I do that so that I can, you know, afford to, to do things. So like I was in SF this whole weekend, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, visiting a friend. And then like a week and a half from now, I'm going camping for the whole weekend. Um, and then I'm like, you know, and I, and I like do my work when I have the time. And I'm also like running, I'm like training for a marathon. So I'm like running five days a week. And so I fit that in and like, it's a lot, you have to like balance your time. You have to be strict with yourself about like when it's work time and when it's not, but it's, it's totally possible. Um, and I think it's all just in what you prioritize. There's enough content and curriculum to where like, if you wanted to study all day, every day you could, like there'd be enough that you could fill your time with. So you have to decide like where you're going to draw the line. And, um, and I think part of that, you, it, it will take time, I'm sure. And I'm still, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm still figuring it out, but yeah, I'm a big champion of med school work-life balance. Yeah. Um, there, in our, per, uh, curriculum, the first two years, pre-clin, that definitely had more time during those years to do what we wanted to do. Um, and it's just very flexible too. So if you did want to have a weekend getaway, it was so doable. I think what we can add is our experience is third year, which is when things hour wise really ramp up. Um, and honestly, yeah, it, you will be in the hospital a good bit of your life during third year. Um, and then it will be much more choosy when you, what free time you have and what you'll do during it. Because even when we leave the hospital, a lot of the times we have to start studying um, for our shelves at the end of our rotations, which a lot of our rotations were only four weeks. So it came up very quickly. So we had to be very strategic with how we spent our time during third year. But even so, only on a couple of rotations did I feel like I was not seeing or doing things as much as I would have liked to, which was mostly just the surgery rotations. Um, aside from that, I feel like I had a really good experience and I was still able to see a lot of my friends and hang out and do a lot of the activities that I wanted to do. It just had to be much more of a priority for me during third year than versus the first two years. Yeah, I completely agree with what Gabby said. Um, the fourth, the third year experience is very accurate. Um, you definitely have to be very mindful with your free time. Um, the other thing I would say about that is it's not really, I mean, depending on what you decide to do after medical school, it's not specific to medical school, it's medicine in general. So, you know, the hours that you see a third year or a fourth year work um, may seem like it's more than a first year, but it's closer to what a traditional resident will be working, if not an attending in the future. So uh, it's nice to see kind of what that is like realistically, because it's what we're signing up for, for the rest of our lives. So um, it's important to kind of get a taste of that too. Um, and it's national ramp up. So they don't just throw us in there um, really. So you have some time. 
Um, someone did ask if we have to do 24 hour like shifts. Um, and yes, there are certain rotations that do require that. Um, you may not end up with one of those. I never ended up on one of those rotations, but that does exist. Um, so keeping it realistic in third year, you won't have the kind of time that you had before and you will have night shifts. Like I'm pretty sure most, almost everyone has done nights. Um, oh, I see a, a shake over there. Gabby has not. Lucky Gabby. Um, but you know, that means you're not going to be seeing your friends if you are sleeping all day and, and working all night. So those things do happen, but I, I have to say, like I was doing my OB and surgery like rotations this year. And I still was able to go to the beach or hike every weekend that I made that a priority for myself. Um, did I go to the closest possible beach and the closest possible hike? Absolutely. But like, I still made that happen. So it really is about, um, being intentional about what you want. Um, and I think that when you have limited time, you make better use of it as well. Okay. And then do you have time for hobbies? Not so much like being able to go do things, hang out with friends, but like building hobbies for yourself that you would want to like continue to do. I know that's something people our age talk about a lot and think about a lot. Um, is that something that is possible in medical school? I mean, Danielle told us that she's running a marathon, so that sounds like a really cool hobby. Hopefully, hopefully I'm running this marathon. I don't know. <laughs> I, might, I might settle for the half marathon if I don't make it happen. Still impressive. Very impressive. Yeah, my hobbies are kickboxing and video games, and I just bought Elden Ring, so clearly I'm making time whether or not I have it because I'm playing the game. Um, you totally have time for your hobbies. Uh, it really just, first two years, 100%. Third year, you'll still have time. Again, you just have to be choosy about what you do with your time. Uh, fourth year, it does get a little bit easier, especially towards the latter half, so you'll have plenty of time. And then after that, it's really you're working a job. So when you have, when you're out of the office, you can go and do what you want. The best part of transitioning from third year to fourth year is that we actually don't have any more exams aside from step two. Um, so when we come home from the hospital, we can do research. We can also like look up our patients if necessary, but we there's just much more time and there's no pressing exam that we have to study for. So there is more time for your favorite things to do. Yeah, I agree with Gabby and I would kind of invite everyone to start looking at what kind of things they wanna pick up over the next couple of years, cause it's a great time to decide on a new hobby that you could be pursuing for the next you know, lifetime um, on the on the side. I picked up surfing partially because of the med school, partially because of the pandemic. It's a nice little socially distant activity, but um, things like that, our class definitely started off um, trying out together and then some people continue doing it afterwards. So lots of opportunities to try out new things, whether it's ge like geographical, like surfing or uh, just kind of broad out there like kickboxing. I have very indoor hobbies. I like to read um, and I've been able to read 25 books on average during medical school each year, which isn't bad. Um, and I'm also like a really big movie watcher and watch like all the movies and I'm still able to do it. I saw most of the Oscar contenders this year, didn't watch the Oscars, missed out on what was apparently a very interesting experience, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I completely agree. Like no matter what the hobby is, you'll find time during medical school to kind of explore and develop it. Okay. Um, before we transition into the actual like Q&A portion, I just wanted to ask the panelists if they have any one thing that they were told when they were applying to medical school or about medical school that they're like, definitely not. That was not, not true at all. And I wish I could just like tell everybody that that's not what med school is like. If you have like a nugget of wisdom along those lines. My biggest thing, because I had no idea what I was doing when I was applying, so I got far too much of my information from SDN and Reddit. They are so pessimistic on that site, and med school life can be actually so fulfilling and so fun with the friends that you make along the way. Um, even third year, which is most likely the hardest year that um, you're going to have during med school, it's 
I still was so fulfilled, like seeing patients. I really enjoyed my time. I don't regret medical school at all. And I know like this is what I want to do. So there's a lot of negativity out there that you're going to listen to. And it seems like every medical student on those sides hates it because they need a place to vent, which is fair. But there's just a lot more like positive and like beautiful things you're going to see in medicine. And it keeps me going even through the darkest of third year. Um, one thing I'll say is that I feel like I have met some of the coolest people in med school and I definitely was afraid going in from reading things on the internet and also just what other people had told me and my experience in undergrad that I'd meet a lot of like very competitive, not friendly people that were there to just like, you know, hammer down and just like get onto their next part of their life and get all their accomplishments in. And that is not the case at all. Like everybody is, as we've been talking about, has so many interests and they all want to get to know people, like not only people in their class, but their patients and just people and, and explore LA. And like, there's all of this wonderful stuff that I, I don't know, maybe in undergrad, I just like didn't have that opportunity because I was like, so focused on getting to medical school, but medical school is like, everything that I had kind of imagined undergrad would be because there's less pressure. Um, so I would say like, if you're worried about this being another four long years, it's, it's not, it's kind of like refreshing in some ways. Yeah. And kind of along those same lines, I think for me, something that I was worried about going into medical school was that it would be kind of like interviewing or the application process nonstop for four years, kind of like that kind of stressful environment, because that's the only real exposure you have to these folks or to what the med school environment is like. Um, but I will say that's probably the most stressful you will ever be with those groups, like that group of people, because after you start uh, med school, everyone's like, you know, the ice has settled in, everything's more chill, and it gets you to really get to know everyone a lot better um, than you do during just interviews and second look days and things like that, which are a little bit more tense and professional in nature. Yeah, I can't think of anything right now that like, I didn't know a lot of people or any people in med school before I came here. So I feel like I didn't get told a lot of things or I like, didn't really have any expectations that I can pinpoint. But I, one thing I was like surprised about um, so far has been like the amount that I feel like I've learned about like the world and like about LA and, the, and about like things that are seemingly unrelated to medicine, like a lot of these social determinants of health. Like, I feel like I've learned a lot about like racism and classism and like the, like just all, all the way, like, and, and they're in our curriculum in a sense, like in a, in a connection to like how they might affect someone's health. But I think I've just like learned more about um, the world. And I feel like I'm, I can like feel myself becoming a better person, which has been like really, Fulfilling, I guess, is a good word to, to describe it, but I guess I didn't expect that when I was, when I pictured med school, I pictured like all of the more academic side of things and like the science and the, the medicine and um, disease and just things like that. And I didn't expect um, to be like, to really grow in like this other aspect of my life, um, which is, and I, and I wonder how much of that is UCLA specific because this school is really focused on health equity and social determinants and and then like we just developed the anti-racism curriculum roadmap and stuff. So I think it's a clear priority here, but I'm, and I'm sure it's present in other schools too, but, um, but that's one thing I was not expecting. Okay, awesome. So with that, um, I will stop the recording and we can kind of go into our live Q&A.